Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Roundup. My name is David Steele, and glad to be with you. Um, so Kyle has a week off, and he is going to be back next week. Uh, today's the Roundup, and we got some really good stories for you. So uh, stay with us. I want to thank everybody that's head has headed over. Oh, has head over to the channel and is watching the stuff. I am getting better, guys. I promise. I know this is not the most aesthetically um, pleasing background, but I am going to get some stuff in here and and make it all the worthwhile for you guys. So, um, yeah. So there's going to be a ton of stuff to come. I just put up Mom Mondays, the first episode uh, last night, because it's you know I fa I told you I would. And so it's going to be an every other week thing, I think. Uh, same thing with Rewatch Wednesdays. I'm going to put, start putting some videos together for you guys. And please head on over to the channel, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button. Uh, let's get this stuff out there for everybody to see. So as I said, this is the roundup. And we got a couple of uh, really interesting stories for you today. So starting out, we have... Um, Anna Kendrick. And Anna Kendrick is going to be making her directorial debut, um, a movie called The Dating Game. Now, anybody who's aware of it or maybe a little on the older side, if you will, um, don't remember this show from the 70s. It was a one contestant was, you know, a bachelor or a bachelorette, and you had three males or females on the other side, and all you could hear were their voices. So you never saw what they look like. Anyways, so this is, so as I said, she's going to be making her directorial debut with this. So um, it's a film on, from The Blacklist, which is a site that is has amazing scripts that just don't get picked up. This was written by Ian McDonald. And this is about a woman or a bachelorette named Cheryl Bradford. And she was a candidate on the show. And she picked bachelor number one. This guy named uh, Rodney Alistair. And I probably butchered his last name, but nonetheless, he ended up being a serial killer. I mean, this is the actual nightmare of all women dating, single women dating. So basically, um, she is um, going to be producing this as well. And this is going to be um, uh, done by Boulder Light Pictures as well. And McDonald is going to be an EP on it, the writer. So right now it's in principal photography, and um, so it's it's in pre-production, and it's going to uh, set for late October to start filming. They're actually doing additional casting as we speak. So this was actually a project that was done um, or is going to be done to be sell, sold to Cannes, and Kendrick and Ford are going to be doing a joint presentation at the buyer's um meeting at TIFF for the Toronto Film Festival, which is actually going on right now. And it's going to be going on for another week or so. So she said, I love the script from the moment, from the moment I read it. And while I was obviously thrilled to play the character of Cheryl, the, the lead, I felt so connected to the story, the tone and the themes around gender and intimacy that when the opportunity came to direct, I jumped at it. It just felt she was it felt meant to be so i'm really curious to see where this takes her as far as what she's going to be doing with it i mean obviously it's a thriller um and it's it's a true story i mean not all true stories are you know great but this one seemed very interesting to say the least i think that um mm -hmm. i think it's i think it's going to be well now do i think she's going to do as well as bradley cooper did with the star is born no <laughs> but um, she has enough acting chops that it, I mean, it's hard enough to direct a film, but she's actually starring and directing. So, I mean, she's done all these other films like Pitch Perfect, like I said, which is turning 10 this year, guys. Like, what's going on with that? I feel old. Uh, <laughs> but um, The Accountant and all these other films. Um, so... Yeah, that, that's going to be a really fascinating um, film to see. I, I'm, I'll, I'll definitely go see that and, and to see how that whole thing plays out. So, 
Um, let's move on. And so our next story is um, Cineworld. Now, Cineworld is right now basically they're they're filing for Chapter Eleven bankruptcy, and so they're at a point right now where they need to have almost two billion dollars of debt uh, forgiven to um, to stay afloat. So they're actually filing it here in the United States. Um, so, I, and I've always said this: I'm really I think the theatrical experience is there's nothing like the theatrical experience. I don't think these cinemas are going to go away. I'm just saying that if, I mean, even if you think about it, even during the pandemic, it was very, very tough not having movies. I mean, luckily we had streaming to keep us afloat, but um, yeah, I, I, I really, um, I really, I love the, I love going to the movie theater and seeing movies. I, I just, I think that's one of the greatest things you can do. Um, so I look forward to every movie in a the theater. I really do because it, it's, it's an experience and it doesn't matter who you go with or what, you always remember that first time you see that movie in a theater. I mean, whether it's Avengers Ed game or, you know, the Batman or whatever it is. So, yeah. Um, I'm glad they're actually starting to take care of some of their financial things and, and do that. Now, this leads to another interesting um, topic, and I'm just going to go right into it. And that's the big, the, one of the big, big stories of the day was the new Knives Out trailer dropped, or teaser trailer, I should say. It's about a minute and 15 seconds, and it looked amazing. Now, the other, I mean, everybody's looking forward to this, but here's the thing. It's on Netflix. Now, the first movie made about $365 million in the theater. And, you know, I, unless there's an exclusive contract saying this can't go to theaters, I wonder, would Netflix, because, they, they, look, they're in trouble. They know they're in trouble. They just lost uh, quite a few subscribers in this last fiscal quarter. So does that mean they would actually do something like what Disney Plus did, and that's um, put like a premium on it and say, well, you can watch this movie, but it's going to be $14.99 to do it. I can't imagine with the success making that it had with the first one, making $350 million, I can't imagine if they don't do something like that. Because what do you, I mean, the, the, the only reason why they would be doing it is for subscribers. But there are people out there that will just subscribe for that thing, maybe Stranger Things, Cobra Kai, and that's it. They'll binge them all, and that's it. And Kyle and I were talking about this at the episode of the uh, Last House of the Dragon episode, which, by the way, if you want to go back and listen to that, that's up to, for you guys as well. And we were talking about how the major difference between Netflix and, um, like, Hulu and with some of their shows and, and mainly Disney+, Disney Plus is that... When one like when one division came out, it wasn't that big. By the end of one division, it was the number one show in the world. And so you can binge Cobra Kai, which I think is dropping this week, and it's going to be gone in two weeks. And so, you know, I really I, and look, that's cool. I mean, if if that's your thing, that's cool. But I just think that you need to have some longevity to it, and. So this is where Disney is just founded. I think, personally speaking, I think they could easily say, you know what? We need to get some money back. We, we need to get subscribers. You can do this, but you'll pay $15. Now, if you're a current subscriber, okay, you can get it for $9.99. But I think they have to try and do something. Because otherwise, why are you making a movie set? It doesn't make any sense. So, yeah, so it, that's going to be fascinating. And by the way, stay tuned, guys, because in a couple of weeks, we're going to be doing a fall preview series or fall preview um, uh, look forward. Uh, and so we're going to be talking about everything that's coming out in October, November, 
and December. And there's a ton of stuff coming up. There's another movie on Hulu I'm dying to see, and that's Hellraiser. And that drops October 7th. And, I mean, I'm of, I'm of the age where I remember the original Hellraiser back in 1987, starring Doug Bradley. And uh, it was Clive Barker. And it, it was just an amazing... I mean, while everybody talks about Freddy and Jason and Michael Myers, that was a great, great story. So, and they went on to do several sequels that didn't weren't as successful, but that first one, that was it. And so, you know, it was all about Pandora's box and, you know, the Cenobites and everything else. So I'm really, really, I'm definitely looking forward to that. So moving on. So let, let's move on from that because, you know, that, that was just like a nugget there. So there's another story that's really... I think going around and made some waves and that's big Papa Iger as John Camp, would like to say, he has made some comments assessing the streaming services. And he basically said in his opinion that he doesn't think all these are going to survive. Let me read you what he had to say. I believe that Netflix is going to continue to thrive. They have some issues now, but they're not going to go away. Uh, he also said that is also clearly a big believer in Disney Plus due to its IP and success thus far. Um, basically, they, you know, they're not primary businesses for them, and they're measured, meaning Apple Plus and, and you know some other Amazon, probably by different standards in terms of bottom line, and they serve other purposes in those companies. Uh, but they're going to stay pat. They're going to continue to grow, and they'll and they'll grow well. They have deep, they've got deep pockets. They've got, uh, they've got great accession to access to customers while they have strong technology platforms. They're proven they know how to do it, so they'll stay. And as for other streamers, he's like, they have some tough hands and it takes a lot of capital to be in the business. I don't think they're all make, gonna make it, which is fascinating because you gotta wonder which ones are, which one is he talking about? Like which, I mean, so you have right now, and this is what's called the streaming wars, okay? You have Netflix, you have Hulu, you have Amazon, you have Apple TV, you have Paramount Plus, you have Peacock, which I can't still believe is the name of a streaming service. And um, I think there might be one more out there. So you have six. And... It's interesting to see or think about which ones they're talking about. Because don't forget, Universal is part of the, that whole, you know, thing. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, if so, I guess the question I pose is this. Which one do you guys think wouldn't survive? Would it be Apple TV? Would it, and it's definitely not going to be Amazon. I mean, Amazon's... Amazon has deep pockets. Apple TV has extremely deep pockets. Okay. Netflix has deep pockets. So are we talking about like a Peacock, a Paramount Plus, things like that? So, I mean, which one do you guys think that it's, it wouldn't survive? I mean, those three that I just named, they're, they're going to be around for a long time. Netflix has been around for 20 years. I mean, they, they're the ones that started I mean, they are the grandfather of streaming, if you will. So they're not going to go away anytime soon. Um, but I do believe the biggest problem, the two biggest problems with um, Netflix is what I was saying earlier about putting all their content on at once. But moreover than that, they can't market a show to save their life <laughs> or a movie. Um, so, I mean, don't get me wrong. You've got your one in ten, like the Irishman, you know, the, or, or whatever it is, but it's, they're few and far between. So, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, if I were guessing, okay. And by the way, he's not CEO anymore, but he's just looking in from the outside in because he did it for 20 years and he was very successful at it. I would suggest to you that probably Paramount Plus and Peacock. And those are the two that are eventually going to fold. But 
right now they're not in any danger of it, but they have to put up good content. And that's why people both subscribe to the services. Yeah, they're cheap, but you know, it, it's especially in today's culture and society with the almighty dollar being so incredibly valuable, where, where is everybody going to put their money, right? You only have a certain number of dollars. Is it going to be in a movie theater pass, like an AMC A-list or Regal Pass? Or is it going to be in streaming services like a Netflix or a Hulu? I mean, look, I, I, would, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but I would imagine Hulu actually got a lot of uh, subscribers because of the success of Prey, you know? And they're going to continue to get a lot of subscribers because if Hellraiser does as well as I think it will and other people think it will, it's going to be really big. So, I mean, I would suggest, yeah. So streaming is one of those things that, while it's convenient, it's not the theater. And if you ask me if you could do streaming or theater, I'll say theater all day long. All day long. There's nothing like sitting down with a, a bowl of a thing, a thing of popcorn and a drink watching your favorite movie on a huge, huge screen. Best sound system in the world. So that's interesting. So, but moving on to another story. So everybody knows the movie Pulp Fiction. Okay. Everybody. So this movie came out in 1994. It basically changed the culture of how movies were made and how they are looked at in today's culture. Quentin Tarantino is probably easily one of the best directors of all time. I mean, look, the man has two Academy Awards for screenwriting. You know, he, all you got to do is look to that. He's one of the best directors of all time. Now, I mean, Inglorious Bastards, Kill Bill, but Pulp Fiction for my money, and I own it, obviously, as millions of other people do, is his masterclass. So for many, many years, he was embroiled with a lawsuit that with Merrimax, which was the studio that actually distributed and put out uh, Pulp Fiction over what was called an NFT. Now, I'll be honest with you. I'm not that familiar with NFTs, so, but I'm just going to read the article here and, and move on. So Merrimax sued against uh, Quentin Tarantino over plans to, re to release non-fungible tokens based on Pulp Fiction has been settled. Terms of the deal announced on Thursday were not disclosed. The parties have agreed to put this matter behind them and look forward to collaborating with each other on future projects. I doubt that. <laughs> Including possible NFTs. Mirabax and Tarantino said in a joint statement. That, by the way, if they, they had been embroiled in this for years, there's no way they're going to work together. Not in the near future, at least. Maybe years from now. And Tarantino said he's only making one more movie. I think that was just to blow smoke. Anyways, moving on. Merrimax sued uh, in November after Tarantino said he was going to release NFTs based on the movie. Early artwork featured images of Samuel L. Jackson and John Travolta, but were replaced with images of the director after the suit was filed. The case asked whether Tarantino, who wrote and owns the copyright to the screenplay for Pulp Fiction, has the right to publish portions of the work through the sale of NFTs. Tarantino argued that the publication of the NFTs are within his reserved rights since they are based on his copyrights to the screenplay and do not infringe on Merrimack's copy to the, copyrights to the movie. According to his deal with Merrimax, Tarantino has the right to, quote, print publication, including without limitation screenplay publication, making of books, comic books, and novelization in audio and electronic formats, as well as application, end quote, as well as, quote, interactive media, or like uh, memes, end quote. He claimed that it's not infringing on any of Merrimax's copyrights since the NFTs would exploit the screenplay for Pulp Fiction and not the movie for itself. Me Merrimax, meanwhile, maintained the right that are far, uh, far reaching, farther reaching, an account for technology not yet created in 1996 when the deal, deal was consummated. The company who owns the copyright to the movie emphasized catch-all language in its contract 
that says it owns, quote, all rights now or hereafter known, end quote, or in all media now and hereafter known. So a couple takeaways here. Number one, always read any sort of contract of any sort because what could end up happening is that you're interpreting one way, they're interpreting another way, and a lawsuit might embroil from this. And this movie is over 25 years old. Number two, they, and this is where people split hairs. So somebody, when they say they own the rights to something, okay, they own the rights to the screenplay, but not the movie itself. Okay, so when you sell something to a studio, okay, you're then giving the rights over. So if I have a screenplay that, let's say, is about, I don't know, a guy trying to make a YouTube channel, okay? And so he goes through all this all this stuff and, you know, adversity, and he comes out and it's on the other end. And I write the screenplay. And then I go over to Merrimax or Warner Brothers or Paramount, whatever studio I want to go to, okay? And Universal, and I say, look, here, I'm going to pitch it to you. And you're like, okay, cool, I want it. So what ends up happening is they, let's say Universal, cuts me a check for $500,000. Now, at that point, once they cut me a check for the, the screenplay, the rights to the screenplay, they can then turn around and make it about chimpanzees. And there's nothing I can do about it because I sold them the right. And this is where the term IP or intellectual property comes from, okay? Because if intellectual property is one of those things, while it's not a physical thing, it's a naturalization of, a, of something. So like a screenplay, for example. And this is where it's splitting. It's very, very close to splitting hairs. I'll give you another example. So in this, so um, there was a um, show that's on Netflix right now. I don't know if it's still there or no. I'll, I'll give you a better example. Okay. There's, there was a um, Hannibal. Okay. The show Hannibal that was on for many years. It's on Netflix now. It stars uh, Matt Nicholson. So when NBC originally got the rights to that, okay, they sold it over to, you know, NBC, but they said, listen, you cannot use any images or any recordings of Hannibal Lecter. This Hannibal Lecter has to be your own interpretation. Better yet, the CBS Access, All Access shows uh, Clarice is another example. They said, and, and I'm bringing up Silence of the Lambs because this is the first one that comes to my mind, and I love the movie. <laughs> but moreover than that, they said you cannot use any, any Hannibal Lecter references has to be your own, meaning it has to be your own interpretation of Hannibal Lecter. It can't be anything from Anthony Hopkins. That means there's no physical me media used, no clips, no sound bites, no images, nothing. So... It's very, very difficult to create something when something's already been created and you don't know where to go from there. So, you know, I mean, now Miramax basically said, look, we own the rights to everything, even if it wasn't invented, because this stuff only came up in the last eight, 10 years from my understanding. Um, and I could be wrong about this NFT stuff. So if I'm wrong, guys, correct me in the comments, please. But, you know, I think that it's very, very important to read any contracts you have. I think it's very, very important to put it in writing. And I think you just have to, you know, have to, you have to be sure. You have to be sure about it. And if you're not, don't do it. Don't sign it. Don't give it, don't give it over. Put everything in writing. And I'm sure everybody that watches watching this or ha is going to watch this has been in a situation where they've either signed something and not read it, because I'm guilty of that too. 
okay, sign something and not read it, and then it comes back to bite them later on. Or they go, it's not that big of a deal. So I'm glad it got settled. I don't think Miramax and Quentin Tarantino will ever work again. Not because of this, because Tarantino said he's only making one more movie. And he, I'm sure he's working on it now. So Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, came that came out, of, that was his ninth film. He said he's only making 10 films. So when he comes out with, you know, an announcement that he's got his 10th film, you know, written, on, it's going to explode. So anyways, that's not the big story of the day. <laughs> so we're, we're at the end, but that is not the big story of the day. The big story, and I get, before we get into anything, I want to just preface by saying this. You have to be able to um, distinguish business from personal. Okay, so let's dive into this. So the CFO of Warner Brothers, Discovery, came out just recently, as the other day, as a matter of fact, today, and said the Batgirl shutdown coverage was, quote, blown out of proportion to its business, end quote, to its business impact. And I want to read this full article to you guys because this, I think, is worth noting. And by the way, I'm not going to pronounce his last name. I'm just going to refer to the CFO as Gunner. So, <clears throat> Warner Brothers Discovery Surprise shelving of Batgirl was, quote, blown out of proportion, according to CFO Gunther. The executive, speaking at a Bank of America conference on Thursday, said that while the, co the company has made, has made tough decisions with regards to its content, investment, and strategy, the focus on what was supposed to be an HBO Max original film was pushed too far by media coverage, with Warner remaining committed to growing its content business. Clearly, the course corrections, making changes quickly, where we don't agree with the track that Warner Media was on, which was the company that was prior to that, prior to Discovery taking over, it was Warner Media. That took a lot of courage and execution early. End quote. Adding a Batgirl specifically, quote, I don't believe it is unusual. We are a creative industry with, and one of the most, and one of the elements of creativity is that there is judgment and views on uh, and judgment on the potential of what of a certain IP might be. Okay, he said the company's creative leaders, like film's chief Michael DeLuca and Pamela Abbey, makes calls on the content decisions. But that, quote, my team has helped them by providing financial data points wherever possible and a framework to assess the potential, the potential from a financial perspective, end quote. He noted that while a lot of headlines are focusing on content as a source of cost savings, the company expects most of its synergies to be outside of content. Warner Brothers Discovery took an $825 million write down on, co on content in its last quarter, which didn't account for Batgirl. Going forward, he said the company is spending more money than it ever has while considering the combined spending of the two companies. Though he added, quote, I'm, I am glad to see a more rational approach to spend. We have, some, we have made some course corrections, but we are in the business to create content and tell fascinating stories, and we will fund that, he said. He also said that Warner Brothers discovers CEO David Zasloff is engaged in forging an overarching strategy, but things are beginning to click. The first priority has been to get the team in place. And I think that David is now almost a complete strong management team. Adding, it took, quote, a lot of courage to make decisions and quickly get the company on the track where we want to see it on. But there are all opportunities of, to be mined from a trove of uh, companies IP. I think there are a couple of clear priorities. DC stands out, says Gunther, alluding to the branch. Quote, as you know, David is still looking for someone to lead that. Specifically, Wizarding World of Harry Potter has huge potential if we can get it right. There is a lot in flight. But clearly, if you look at it from a risk and reward perspective, 
leveraging some of those brands improves your return profile, end quote. And looking further out, he sh it shows sign of op optimism and ca caution. On the one hand, he said, quote, I think the opportunity is enormous. I view it as a Boeing 747 flying on one engine, end quote, noting all the potential options are on the table. But on the other hand, he said the financial data his team assessed after the merger did not align with some of uh, things they had access to pre-merger forcing an adjustment. And he also noted, quote, there is an uncertainty in the macroeconomic environment, no question about it, end quote. Okay, there is a lot to digest here. Number one, as I said prior, you have to keep the business from the person. Now, that being said, okay, he's looking at it just from the business side. They, he's not looking at it from the side of every single person that worked on that a specific, I'm talking specifically about Batgirl here. He's not looking at it from the perspective of every single person, from the directors, to the EPs, to the stars, to the crew that worked on this film day and night for months and to get it just scrapped and thrown out the door and say, eh, and totally discarded. Okay. And, you know, I mean, if you go on Twitter, there, there was a whole thread about how one of the, the co-stars, you know, was crying herself to sleep and, and you know, she, she, put everything she had into it and everything else. I mean, Leslie Grace has not said anything about this. And I don't think that she's going to say anything about this. But what I think those comments do is they not only disrespect the company, okay, but they disrespect all the people that worked on those films. Um, I get it's business. Hollywood is a business, let's face it. I mean, there's only one reason why they put this stuff out. You have to spend money to make money. I get it. But at the same time, you also have to look at it from a personal point of view. And the fact is that they, they busted their asses to do this. And eight, nine months is gone. Just totally disregarded. And to have a funeral showing... What are you doing? Like, I, I don't understand. Now, I get it, okay? They wanted to see whatever it was and, and whatever else. But at the same time, and look, here's the thing. It's different with a, it's different with a feature theatrical movie because you spend $100 million, you get 300 back, you made 150, I'm talking about after market, you made 150, 200, 150 to 200 million dollars profit. Okay. There was no, there was no coming back from this. They spent 90 million dollars and they weren't picking up any subscribers. Okay. And it, it, it didn't, so all the money was paid up front. I get that. But at the same time, you just can't disrespect you. I mean, I don't want to go as far as to say it was almost what um, Jake, Jay Park did to uh, Spar Scarlett Johansson, but you're totally disrespecting him. Now, all that being said, okay, th there's another comment in there that I thought was extremely telling. Two comments, actually. That was extremely uh, telling and fascinating. And let me get to those. Okay, near the end of the article, he says, um, as, as you know, David is looking for someone to lead. When he's talking about, I think there's a couple of clear priorities. DC stands out. I, as you know, I think David is looking for someone to lead that specifically. Now, here's the thing. Um, last time I checked, okay, and I could be totally wrong. You had arguably the biggest draw in Hollywood. And that's Dwayne Johnson playing Black Adam. Um, if he isn't going to lead this, 
okay, what are you going to do? Are you going to bank everything on the flash? And by the way, there, there are reports that Ezra Miller isn't even, you know, uh, you know, I mean, he's going along with it, but he's reluctantly. So if you want a hard reset, a, a 10 year reset, and that's what everybody's been saying all along and everything else. Isn't he, Dwayne Johnson, the one to lead this? I, I don't understand that. Because here's the thing. If Black Adam comes out, and from what, what the testing is, from all results, it looks very good. As good, if not better, than The Dark Knight. That's to be seen. But, that being said, then you still have The Flash. What, I mean, that, that's a $250 mess you can't clean up and it doesn't matter because Ezra Miller is not going to do any press mark my words on that or very very limited press because you don't know what's coming out of his mouth so I really it, it looks like they're shooting themselves in the foot now all of that being said I said and I've contended for months when this merger happened, they are not going to get all of their ducks in a row until the first of the year. Okay. So, look, I, I get that. So, I'm very curious to see. I will give. I will give them until the first of the year. Now, look, they've had some serious success with, you know, some other things, and that's fine. Like a Wonder Woman that made a billion dollars, but that was before this. Or an Aquaman that made a billion dollars. Fine. But I'll tell you right now, if these next two DC films flop, they're in serious trouble. Serious, serious trouble. I mean, so, I, I don't know. And, and, you know, it's one of those things because, you, you know, from all indications, there's cameos and the flash, and it's just, it's a mess. So that's what they should be worrying about, frankly. And, and I think that's, you know, the other comment I wanted to get to, which I thought was fascinating, was near the end of the article, too, where he says, on the one hand, I think the opportunity is enormous. I view it as a Boeing 747 flying on one engine. Well, most planes crash at that point. <laughs> If you're flying on one engine, you're going down, okay? So that's exactly what they're projecting it down at this point. They need to correct everything they can about this. And if they don't, they're done. They're done with this whole thing. You're never going to be able to reboot this, ever. It doesn't matter how many Batmans you put out. It doesn't matter how many... Jokers you put out, it doesn't matter how many Wonder Woman you do, you're never going to be able to reboot this. And it's going to be interesting, too, because you've got Joker 2 coming out next year. Okay? You've got the Batman 2, and I spoke to Phil Walsh about this, and you can actually go back and watch that um, conversation I had with him. But I asked Phil the question, do you think they would ever merge the two? And, you know, you can go back and watch what he said on it. But I think that that's, that's their last-ditch effort. That's their last-ditch effort. And if they don't do anything, they're done. So, um, but my biggest, th my biggest takeaway from this is he disrespected everybody that worked on that, on that film. And... If I were one of the cast or one of the crew and I heard this, you're basically putting money over or write off with $825 million, not including, not including Batgirl. You're putting it over making content. So anyways, that's my take on it, guys. I, I just, that's the kind of, that's the kind of, uh, business business. I mean, you can see, he obviously doesn't care about, all he cares about is the almighty dollar. That's it. And um, it's sad. It really is. Because everybody wants, all they want is a good movie. 
All they want is a good movie. All they want is a good show. All they want is good content. And when you do things to jeopardize that or, you know, scrap something or whatever else, it, it just doesn't work. And that's when people get turned off. You know, I mean, all you got to do is, all you got to do is take a look at House of the Dragon. And I keep, and I keep going back to this, but this show is one of the, if not one, one in the top three, okay, shows in the world. That's all you got to see. So, and Ring of Power is on tonight. And so I think that, you know, that's going to grow. So anyways, all right, guys. So that's it. That's, that's all I got for you guys this week. Um, couple of house cleaning notes or house, couple of things to, to wrap things up. Number one, um, as I said, Mob Mondays, first week of Mob Mondays is up. Uh, Brad Rochefort and I did The Departed. Uh, I was kind of holding back on that, but go check that out, guys. Um, and so um, you'll see a unique conversation with a screenwriter. I mean, not a big, big screenwriter, but he has written scripts for directors. And so we talk, and that's his favorite movie. And he goes into depth about it. Um, he was a blast. Come on. I can't wait to get him back, back on for another uh, video. Uh, number two, we watch Wednesdays. I'm going to be starting to watch Wednesdays very soon. I got to sit down and watch Steve Jobs again. I have an idea about, and I know these videos are like super long and you guys don't want to watch them. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I've got a structure in which I'm going to use that I'm going to try and make these 25 to 30 minute videos and get everything that is necessary and show you everything um, in that. So yeah, rewatch Wednesdays are going to happen very soon. Just I'm, I'm working things out. Um, number three, social media. So you can go shoot me a message on Twitter at wannabe rounder. I'll leave the link in the description. I'll leave the uh, name in the description, but it's uh, on Twitter. It's W A N N A B E R O U N D E R. And I says, as I said, I'll leave it in the description for you guys on Instagram. It's D Caduto. So go check that out. Uh, hit me up and uh, shoot me a message about movies and I will respond to you. Guys, I'd love to have your comments in the, in the videos, please. I will respond to everything. Um, I just want to know people who are starting to watch it and like this content. Please subscribe and like. It's free. It's going to get this out there. And this is an extension of the podcast. I'm not doing the podcast right now, but uh, YouTube is the next best thing. So I want you guys to enjoy the content as much as possible. Um, yeah. And I got, you know, so Kyle is going to be, so we got House of the Dragon next week for episode four. And then um, Patreon. So, guys, I got a Patreon. Head on over to patreon.com backslash Real Talks. Uh, just punch in Real Talks in the search bar, and that will come up. There's four very affordable levels there for you guys. $3. It's a cup of coffee at your local coffee shop, almost. $7. It's, that's almost a gallon of gas, guys. I mean, $6. So, you're getting, essentially, a shout-out on every single video um, for a month. $15 gets you a t-shirt and a mug, plus a shout out. $20 a month is going to get you a one-on-one -on -one Zoom meeting with myself and all those other goodies. So it will help me out greatly. So go over there and, and please check that out. Um, yeah. So, I mean, we're, we're just going to keep moving on. Flashback Fridays. So we got another episode. It might not be out tomorrow, but definitely the week after. Um, and we got Avengers Endgame. So another billion dollar movie by Marvel. We are counting down the days in the weeks in the months to Wakanda forever. This is going to be probably one of the top three films left this year. Um, next to Knives Out, next to Avatar, The Way of Water. Um, I really believe it's going to make over $215 million opening weekend just because of the, uh, you know, I wouldn't be shocked if they dropped another trailer, D23, or very soon after that. Um, yeah, and and so that's going to be an absolute joy to see. Uh, stay tuned for that. 
um, yeah, and I'm going to have, you know, I'm going to continue to go get interviews and, you know, give you guys the best content I can. And that's my goal. So, um, yeah. Okay. Um, I don't have anything else. So next week, um, as I said, Kyle will be back and we got it. You know, we'll, we'll definitely talk about D23 next week in the roundup because I'm sure that Disney is going to be dropping a lot of stuff if they haven't already. And, um, yeah, everything else, we'll just keep going forward. All right, guys, it's been, um, an absolute pleasure and I can't wait to, uh, so, okay. Have a great day, guys. Be safe.